what could be the observational signature of dark matter in globular clusters. Um, so what have motivated us to do this paper? We know that globular clusters consist of dense concentration of stars with typical diameter of 30 parsecs. They belong to the list of the oldest astrophysical objects um, with typical weights of 11.5 giga years to 12.5 giga years. So the conditions under which they are formed are, and the various possible mechanisms for their formation are both open questions. So uh, it seems that we have the first stars in the globular clusters that were supposed to be produced in our galaxy. And, but uh, we don't know the rule, and also we don't know the origins of these globular clusters. They have attracted too much attention in the beginning of the 70s due to the discovery of X-ray source and also that they contained millisecond pulsars. And also during the 70s, uh, some uh, authors like Aarons and Silk, Wheeler, Frank and he discovered that uh, globular clusters could also hold some intermediate mass black hole. They had studied a large sample of globular clusters and concluded that some of the X-ray flux could be well explained considering an intermediate mass black hole inside of the globular clusters. So uh, they inferred this conclusion based on the luminosity, on the total mass, and the stellar uh, velocity dispersion profile. And combining this these numbers, they had some relations to be established, like the M sigma star relation, the total mass and the stellar mass relation, and the total luminosity and the total mass relation. So they could fit the X-ray uh, signals with the hypothesis that there should exist black holes, intermediate mass black holes in the globular clusters. Um, so. In our paper, we are going to address two important questions. What could be the observational signals of dark matter in globular clusters? In our case, we are going to consider some globular clusters that might hold an intermediate mass black hole. And we are going to model the dark matter particle in a specific way. So how can dark matter be hidden in these globular clusters in such a way that the detection becomes so difficult? Well. We know that the dark matter is the primary constituent of many galaxies and clusters of galaxies, and it dominates over the luminous matter by a factor of five. So what could be the amount of dark matter that could exist in globular clusters? This is an interesting question to be answered. Mm. And if we had dark matter in globular clusters, uh, how could be its signals? We know that dark matter particle can annihilate or decay. In this case, we could have dark matter annihilation producing gamma ray flux. We would have an uh, observable gamma ray line produced. If we don't observe this gamma ray line, we could place limits and constraints on dark matter. And large concentrations of dark matter could also uh, change the, some stellar evolution mechanisms. You know that the gamma ray uh, source are the main uh, possibility for discovering of dark matter in this situation. But we propose ourselves to study another band of the electromagnetic spectrum using radio wavelengths. So, uh, what do you know about dark matter distribution? Dark matter distribution is one of the most important questions to be answered and to give answer to the flux to be produced. Uh, most of the small components of dark matter, matter are modeled with a uh, spheric symmetric distribution. And this uh, modeling is in agreement with the central uh, regions of the halos. So uh, we could consider models in which dark matter halos should exhibit a steep central cusp and this um, dark matter density should be proportional to some power of r to minus beta. But since we are considering globular clusters that have intermediate mass black holes, 
we are going to consider another different kind of profile. It's an enhanced dark matter profile, which we call here spike profile. In the literature, there are a lot of different kind of simulations for situations, especially involving black holes. We can have a navajo frank white profile, we can have navajo frank white plus spike profile, we can have mini spike profiles, and we can have the own spark, uh, spike profile. And the model globular clusters will be for n 7 tuck Omega Sen and NGC 6266. These globular clusters were very well studied by Hubble satellite telescopes, and also there is some um, interesting point about 47 tuck. It's now to be gamma ray bright. So uh, if it's gamma ray bright, there is a good possibility to study dark matter in the inner regions of these globular clusters. There, they have some properties that we can analyze here. For example, we are considering that these three globular clusters hold intermediate mass black hole. So some information about these black holes are useful. For example, we have the stellar velocity dispersion here for these three globular clusters. The supposed mass of the black hole, these two have similar mass. The mass of omega sin is one order of magnitude bigger than the other two ones. We also have the age of the black hole, which is in the order of giga years, and also have the distance from these globular clusters until us. We use these quantities to build the spike profiles to be analyzed here. And what do you know about the amount of dark matter that might exist in globular clusters? We know that early works of King Christ and et al. put some limits in dark matter and globular clusters. They had studied uh, some globular clusters and they, they concluded that at least 1.5 times the mass of the luminous matter should be dark. This can be translated to a number of at least 60% of the mass of the, global, of the globular cluster could be dark. But then for other clusters, these limits could be even smaller. For example, for 47 Tuck, they had estimated that at least 25% of the total mass of the globular cluster could be dark. These are early numbers. We are going to work to talk more about these numbers after. So it's interesting, since we are going to, to try to build some flux, it is interesting to, to do a connection between particle physics model and dark matter distributions. And we know that prompt flux emits, uh, emitted from annihilation of dark matter can be factored by a part that depends on the particle physics model and a part that depends on the dark matter distribution. Here, for example, this part depends on the particle physics model. Here we have the mass of dark matter, the annihilation cross-section. Here we have the spectrum to be produced, which depends on the final state and also on the mass of dark matter. And here we have the J factor. So what we are going to do? We are going to work with both flux, radio flux and gamma ray flux. Here I can show you an example again. There is a part that depends on the particle physics model and a part that depends on dark matter distribution. And here this eta accounts for dark matter annihilation, it should be two here. Here is the distance from the source until us, and here is the spectrum that should be produced to consider uh, the final product of dark matter annihilation, which will be, uh, in the end, it will be gamma rays. Here also we have some example of gamma ray flux. This is not the final expression but we can see a dependence of the model. And here in the end, the flux will depend also in the angular distribution of dark matter. So uh, why should we study synchrotron radiation? Uh, cosmic ray electrons in the galactic magnetic field emit synchrotron radiation. And this kind of radiation accounts for most of the continuum spectrum in the range of 30 gigahertz. Uh, if you have an electron in a curved path or an electron in a 
straight line and it's very accelerated, uh, we know from classical theory that it will emit electromagnetic radiation. Uh, if this particle is accelerated to very high speeds, this radiation is called the synchrotron radiation. Um, but uh, considering the pair A uh, plus and minus in the cosmic rays, we can also have other loss mechanisms. For example, we can have inverse Compton mechanism. In the Compton mechanism, the photon loses part of its energy. In the inverse Compton mechanism, the electron transfers part of its energy to the photon. We can also have synchrotron loss. We can have the decelerated radiation, the burning stalling, and the Coulomb interactions. This is what you need to know the main uh, energy process in order to calculate the singleton radiation. So here we have an important uh, equation that needs to be solved in order to compute the singleton signals. Uh, this equation is related to the electron equilibrium spectra. This capital D denotes the diffusion term. This B loss is the, the various energy mechanisms that the electron can lose its energy. And this is the source term terms. The source term depends on the annihilation cross-section or uh, the, the dark matter distribution and the mass of dark matter candidate. And also we have a dependence in the electron injector spectrum, which also depends on the mass of the dark matter and the final result of dark matter annihilation. Uh, in our simulations, we are going to work with a 34 GeV dark matter candidate. In this case, uh, the main energy loss will be due to inverse Compton and also synchrotron radiation. And in such situation, we can neglect the special contribution of diffusion term and then the final electron equilibrium spectrum reduced to this quantity. We also have here the particle physics information, the loss term, and here the injection spectrum of electron. But we have to uh, also to, to calculate the synchrotron emissivity of the electron. The synchrotron emissivity depends on the electron equilibrium spectrum, which is here, and also depends on the synchrotron power. And this is an important issue. Well, here we need to calculate the singleton power of a single electron. The power of a single electron can be given by this expression. We know that it depends on the mass of electron, on the magnetic field. We have some sine of alpha, some f of x. So how could we translate this synchrotron power? We know that electrons, uh, they walk and their ages can change from me, uh, thousand to million years until they lose their uh, energy. And at some point they interact with particles, charged particles, and with the galactic, galactic magnetic field, and their pitch angles gradually becomes handled. So we have to, to take this into account and do some kind of integration. And after that, the average average power of emission of a synchrotron electron uh, uh, compared to an ensemble of electrons with the same Lorentz factor can be done given by this expression. These numbers are related to the modified Bessel function of five-thirds order. Um, and it's uh, the relation between the frequency and the critical frequency new C. The, the critical frequency can be understood as the frequency which the electron emits most strongly. In the other page we have a graph, for example. Here is the critical frequency. Uh, in this region we have a broad peak. After the critical frequency the F function uh, falls off sharply. So. This is the final uh, power to be uh, mm -hmm. considered in our calculations. That's not the whole history, but at least most of the points that should be known are here. And 
now we have a complete information about the flux that need to be uh, concluded and computed here. The flux depends on the distance from the globular clusters until us and on the electron emissivity, which depends on the distribution of the electron and on the singleton power. We are going to calculate this flux for these three globular clusters and after for this one, which is the most studied, do it today. I thought is that there is some dark matter constituent on it. We are going to compare these results with the ones used to constrain some gamma rays hypothesis for dark matter. So, as I told you, the most studied uh, dark matter density profiles are uh, Navarro, Frank White, Esnaf, Enasto, Moore, Burkett, some isothermal profiles, and they have some power dependence here. When you consider a black hole and dark matter in such a situation in a globular cluster, you have to plug this information together, the dark matter information and also the black hole information. Here we have a different kind of profile, which has three regions to be analyzed. Here is the region, uh, the inner region of, of the black hole. Here is the most important region. In this situation, here is where we put the information of uh, what's the amount of dark matter that should be in the globular cluster. So uh, this, this profile, for this profile, we have the information of the mass of black hole, of the stellar velocity dispersion, of the mass of dark matter, annihilation of dark matter, and of the age of the black hole. So this is the way that this profile is built. In the end, what we do is that the profile is normalized by requiring that the mass of the black hole is the same is in the same order of the mass of the spike. And this results that the quantity of dark matter, the amount of dark matter, is at least 1% of dark matter mass of the whole globular cluster, 47 Turk. This is the same that um, Brown's Lacroix had done in their papers. But they also co uh, considered some millisecond pulsars constituent. And when we do these calculations, we, we can have, we can plot these profiles here. For example, here we have spike one, which is our profile with our parameters used to fit the the radio profile, and this is Brown's uh, spike profile, which was used to fit the gamma rays uh, signals. And you see that this spike, this is just an illustration. This graph would, could stop in, the, in this region. You see that this goes until uh, R greater than RSP. This RSP is the radius of influence of the spike. So we could stop at some point here. This is just uh, an illustration of how we stop it and how this, does this profile be Can I ask you a quick question? Now, how, if you go back two slides, how do we know that the mass, that one, uh, that. Yeah, no, this, well, this one or the next one, that the uh, mass of the spike should be of order of the mass of the black hole? How? How do we impose that? You impose that... Uh, or how is this known? You, you have the mass, you have the density is mass over the volume. You have the mass of the black hole in one side, and then you have the density times the volume. And when you use all this information here and plug these numbers together, you have some dependence on these gamma factors and these gamma factors. And when you you do some this kind of hypothesis, you want to guarantee that the whole mass will be concentrated in this region. But I still, if I follow this, I could still have a 10, 10 percent or 10 times, you know, the factor could, yes. be, could be very large. Yes, at least if you consider this kind of situation, right. the, this could be five. But if you look here, it depends on the gamma factor. I don't gamma know. I don't gamma know changes it. for gamma is the number used to fit the traditional profiles that we have. Navarro, Burkitt, Moore, isothermal. <coughs> Generally, it changes from zero to two. 
zero to two. So you have ninety four with two point two five, and you can have uh, five over two, which is two point five, and this is a big number, right? If you follow all the other spike profiles by Paulo Gondolo, Lacroix, Silk, and uh, Celine Bohem, all these numbers, this number is, how can I say, it's greater than the one used by them. But this kind of profile was studied uh, considering the nine years of working of Fermilat observation. So this motivated this special number for this profile, which guarantees that the mass of black hole should be the, in the order of the, the spike mass. But you can, I agree with you, we can have different number here. here. In fact, in other papers, these numbers are more conservative, 2, 2.5, uh, but the, the message is that, that the whole mass of the spike should be in the order of the okay. black hole mass. Part of my question, I'll return to it later, but you know, when you had your table with, with various masses for the black hole and, mm -hmm. and age for the black holes, those numbers were incredibly precise. Mm -hmm. Maybe not accurate, but they were precise. Mm -hmm. um, and so one wonders, and I'll return to that later, I don't mm -hmm. want to stop you, how those numbers were obtained you know, by looking at velocity dispersion profiles and such. And there's large errors on those numbers, mm -hmm. and I, I wonder, and let's return to that later, if those errors are accounted for, and it's allow for a range, in fact, of spike masses compared to, to the black hole mass. But let's carry on, we'll return to that. Okay. okay. Thank you. <coughs> so, this is the density profile, especially for 47 Turk. If you try to fit the, the gamma rays signals, you have this kind of profile. And if you try to fit the radial flux, you have this kind of profile. In the end, what we have, the radial flux for these three globular clusters uh, presents signals in the order of Mikrojansky. So we have some uh, continuous radial surveys uh, for these globular clusters. We plotted the re their results here. Here, they're plotted for 5 gigahertz. For 47 Tuck, we have a limit of 40 uh, Mikrojansky. For Omega Sen, we have a limit of 20 Mikrojansky. And for NGC 6266, we have a limit of 36, 36 Mikrojansky. We, we also have other important surveys that have done, was done in 47 Tuck, as the one done by the Hubble Satellite Telescope, and also by the X9 source. And they place limits in the in 47 tucks for a frequency of 5.5 and 9 gigahertz. So, uh, if we look at Brown's results for gamma rays and for our from for our results about radio flux, we will see that the annihilation cross section uh, that should be used to fit the gamma ray results will differ by seven order of magnitude uh, if, if you use another one to fit the radio results. So we are very far from the thermal canonical cross-sections. So what could be the viable uh, particle physics models uh, that could be able to explain these results? I'm not saying that these models will explain, but I'm just saying some kind of models. We could have some super heavy dark matter uh, we could have some suppressed annihilation cross-sections mediated by Z-prime mediators, uh, extra-scalar mediators, and some kind of annihilations which are velocity-dependent, the P-wave annihilation. What needs to be done in our work? We want to take into account the dynamical effects of the black hole and the dark matter interaction. For example, we don't know how much of the dark matter amount will fall into the black hole. And we want to predict some of the dark matter and the black hole interaction. And we need to account for also the black hole growth time scale for core relaxation, algebraic response of dark matter between other points. Mm -hmm. So what can we conclude from this talk? especially speaking about 47 Tuck. 
We know that some hypotheses were done about dark matter constitutional heat, and some authors consider a millisecond pulsar uh, uh, with dark matter. But when we try to fit their results with the same cross sections, their num numbers don't work for radio waves, wave signals. So we have assumed a dark matter population, and it's dominant over the millisecond pulsar population. We had considered the 40 G, uh, 34 G dark matter, the same one that we use, we use it to explain the, the gamma ray assess in the center of galaxies. And we have investigated the possibility of proving dark matter in the inner part of three globular clusters using a special spark profile. The annihilation used to explain the gamma rays of 47 tuck is too high to agree with the continuous radio observations. So there are several possible interpretations for, from our results. Either this channel of annihilation is not the correct one, the mass of dark matter is not the correct one, the amount of dark matter in the globular clusters is not the correct one, or even dark matter doesn't exist in these globular clusters. But we still need to do more simulation, especially working with these effects in order to have a good explanation for both combined messengers. So that's my talk. Great. All right, floor is open for questions.